or an element of the skandhas that are free of the asuras. But not every part of his mental, his or her mental uh, makeup is the truth of the path. That person still is subject to sensory cognition, sensory perception. And the sensory perception has nothing to do with the path. So if you had to identify it, you might want to, perhaps you would call that a, an, an, not an uncontaminated part of his skandhas, or perhaps even further, you could I'd say it is, it is contaminated. Uh, so uh, there's that way to understand that the person's skandhas that were produced by uh, uh, samsaric causes, making them uh, contaminated or related to the mental fiction, uh, that continuum has not uh, been terminated. Uh, so not until that person, uh, that person's life ends, then when his or her life ends, then because they don't have any mental fictions any longer, then there's no more samsaric rebirth. So then that becomes, uh, the person's liberation becomes the form of nirvana, which is our remaining. Then uh, there are various ways to think of, well, what happens to the person at that time? that arahat once they passed away. <clears throat> so, the position that is generally accepted as the correct position is that the mind continuum is, does not uh, undergo extinction. Uh, the mind continues, but it's no longer contaminated mind. So that, what happens to that arahat is that he or she will undergo a form of birth there are four different kinds of uh, birth that one can take. And they will take a birth which is, in Tibetan it's called zuike, which is often is translated as miraculous birth. But it really um, means something more like something that occurs spontaneously, that there's no gestation period, and one, once, the, take, once the next life is taken, it is uh, taken immediately in a fully formed manner. That's what the, that form of birth is. Uh, more specifically means that <coughs> that form of spontaneous birth could, could, could likely take birth, for instance, in a Buddha field. If it takes birth in a Buddha field, then a Buddha field is identified as a realm that is separate from samsara. So then that person would remain in that uh, state of quiescence, uh, still existing, still a, a living being uh, as an arahat, uh, being reborn in some, perhaps some birth year. That in it, that nearly took that in it, one to repeat to that said. That one to repeat to that said, nearly repeat to the third one of the Luchi, Hebe, Jesu, Baba is two to the Luchi, two to the Nelly, and it Hebe, one to the day. だって、ね、ちょっとさ、そうそう。ちょっとさ、そうそう。ちょっとさ、そうそう。ちょっとさ、そうそう。ちょっとさ、そうそう。ちょっとさ、そうそう。ちょっとさ、そうそう。ちょ
is because the reason that's given is uh, to establish the existence of uh, that temporary goal is uh, that it is asserted in the scriptures uh, and um, then the typical or the, the classic quote is actually not a canonical scripture but uh, from Nagarjuna's Ratnavali which says something to the effect that uh, <coughs> Mm-hmm. Jiva mm-hmm. means uh, uh, generosity. Generosity is a cause, karmically, to bring about the result of uh, um, uh, abundance of possession, so prosperity. Prosperity comes from um, generosity. Chim ki de, and then chim, uh, chim means uh, uh, morality, uh, shila. Chim ki means by, on the basis of morality, comes, and then the word literally is uh, happiness. But happiness means uh, the, the well-being of a favorable rebirth as, as a human being or a worldly god, for instance. So those two, sta- those two statements of, of the, the clauses for those two qualities, while they're taken from Narajuna's treatise, Ultimately, they have sources from uh, the Buddha's uh, you know, sayings themselves. So that's the, the it's said. It's so is it said in the scriptures. However, it's not. It's not. The scriptures are described as a valid basis for drawing an inference, because and then the scriptures are described as jeva sumgi dape lum, and that's a very important uh, phrase that refers to an analysis of that, that, that followers are uh, meant to, uh, to cultivate uh, in order to be able to um, be confident in the scriptures as being trustworthy. So there are three kinds of analysis. And those three, if we, we can engage in those three kinds of analysis, based on the three kinds of epistemic object that are associated with the scriptures. And to say that, to, literally says, Jehoshim Gidakba, means to, literally means to be pure. But it means, what it means is that the Buddhist scriptures are known to be uh, correct, or known to be uh, unerring. Dakba, pure here means free of error. Um, based on this threefold analysis. And when we determine that the Buddha's body of sayings as a whole, which includes these three kinds of epistemic object, there's nothing that we can discover about them that it, using the three forms of analysis that can we can determine to be erroneous. Therefore, whatever the Buddha may say about things that are beyond our comprehension, such as the nature of karma and the workings of karma, and especially in its more subtle forms, we can rely on it. And so then it's saying, therefore, when, because the Buddha taught uh, about the top, the causes that will bring about a higher, uh, higher realm rebirth, and they come from the flawless canonical scriptures, then uh, we can use that as a valid argument, a valid inference uh, to establish the existence of that goal, the temporary goal of saying how can, there is such a thing as a higher uh, realm rebirth uh, because uh, it, is, it is established on the basis of spiritual authority uh, which is free of any error uh, as determined by the three kinds of analysis. Uh, <coughs> Nasa. 
the means of, of gaining uh, that temporary goal. Essentially, uh, then the three uh, principal uh, causes are uh, generosity, which brings the higher state quality of prosperity, morality, which brings the higher state quality of the form of existence, literally the body, but it means the, that form of rebirth. And then thirdly, patience brings the higher realms quality of uh, having a, uh, an, a, an extensive or a, a Good retinue, I mean, it's a good uh, circle of associates, companions, and so on. And uh, so these, are, these three elements together are sort of the essential attributes of the elevated state or the higher realm state. Um, so, um, the, thing about the, the kind of the philosophically significant. Uh, point about this topic is that it is described uh, as being a, 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 a subject uh, which is to use a I don't know, literal term, literal translation of the epistemological term, uh, extremely hidden object. Uh, it, uh, Extremely hidden means it's something that is not seen, literally an unseen thing versus a seen thing. A seen thing is something that we have direct experience of. And then among those things that we don't have direct experience of, uh, there are things that are accessible to us through reasoning. Those are slightly hidden things. And then the third category is things that are extremely hidden, meaning they're beyond ordinary comprehension, beyond the ability of an ordinary person to uh, determine with certainty for himself or herself. So saying the, the temporary goal of a higher realm rebirth falls into that third category. So then one uh, kind of uh, sort of uh, question might arise. Well, what's hidden about human beings? Uh, form of just a human being's life is is, an, is a, an exemplar of a high, of this higher status. Human beings can see one another, so how hidden uh, is it, right? Uh, and even human beings have the ability to achieve levels of uh, one point of concentration in which they can become directly evident of uh, directly aware of worldly gods. So maybe ordinary human beings can't see worldly gods, but Human beings do have the capacity to uh, perceive worldly gods, and certainly among the, the realm of a particular realm of worldly gods, all the be all the worldly gods that are in that realm, they see one another. So what's hidden? What's, why do we say that this is a hidden subject? So that needs to be answered. That question needs to be answered. That is uh, philosophically uh, needs to be understood in the philosophical sense of why it's hidden. So, uh, it, it, uh, first thing is to um, identify those three types of epistemic objects, which you already mentioned, right? Kaon uh, Lugur means the things that are seen are the things that are evident to us directly, right? Uh, then, uh, uh, things which are slightly hidden are subjects such as selflessness and impermanence, those subject matter that was covered in the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths. Those things are not evident to, our, to us directly, but if we use the proper form of inferential reasoning, we can in fact determine their truthfulness. And so they're only slightly hidden, so they are accessible to us. But then there's this third category of entities which are extremely hidden, meaning only a Buddha, not even Arahats, not even very advanced um, Bodhisattvas, can fully comprehend a certain type of subject matter. 
And typically that refers to the workings of karma, subtle workings of karma. So then the basis for the argument that proves the existence of this temporary goal is that the Buddha's teaching is made up of those three types of uh, entities. He's taught, he taught the five skandhas. That's evidence, things, things that we can observe and verify ourselves. He taught the Four Noble Truths uh, and, and the, how to comprehend them. Uh, and we can investigate those and using our own inferential reasoning, we can determine there's no argument or no proof that we can adduce which can show that what the Buddhas had ta taught about that second category of objects is false or flawed or erroneous in some way. So then that is the second kind of uh, then, um, determination that what the Buddha had to say about that category of objects is uh, error-free. Right? So we can also examine what he said about evident things, teaching of the five skandhas, and, and we can determine, yes, everything that he says about objects of ordinary experience, we can verify. Right? So then that is something that we can we can recognize. There's nothing from our direct experience which can which which is at odds with what the Buddha said about directly evident objects. So that's his first two categories. Then the third category of those extremely hidden objects. As I said, it's by definition, are things that we cannot directly verify or indirectly verify. But what we can do is we can examine in the in the whole the, the whatever uh, instructions, whatever whatever um, doctrine the Buddha taught about that subject of extremely hidden objects. Mainly, uh, what are the karmic causes? that are responsible for uh, a particular individual, one of his own followers, for instance, he would sometimes, he would, uh, he would reveal. So the, the word is, the uh, same word is used as to prophecy, but what it really means is to reveal. He would reveal to his disciples, oh, this disciple who had this very unusual thing occur in his or her life uh, is due to something that occurred at some you know, vast time in the past, which even people who have, uh, uh, you know, some clairvoyance cannot uh, identify. Uh, and so he, he, there are many different instances like that. And if we examine them, we cannot find anything that is said in different places in the scriptures that are contradictory or, or, in, in, or in any way, um, you know, uh, at odds with, uh, with that. So it, whatever he said about karma is consistent in every respect. There's another statement which says, that for instance, he, he never said things like bathing would purify you. So there's another example that was, was given. So he didn't say anything about uh, you know, karma that uh, was kind of counter, but, but the obstacles are mental in nature. And so there are things like that. So these are all parts of hidden, destructive hidden uh, objects. So then that third, and that form of analysis, if we carry it out to its full extent, and we can determine that we don't, we can't, we can't identify anything that um, kind of nullifies what the Buddha may have said. We here he said this, and here he said the two are kind of contradictory. Can't find any such thing. So those are the three kinds of analysis that taken as a whole then give us a justification. It would be prudent for us not to uh, abide by what he said about the nature of karma, for instance. He said bad karma will cause you to be born in health, but we can't determine it's true. We would do well nevertheless, given what the Buddha, who the Buddha is, what the Buddha taught. We ought to trust that word. So it, it, it rises to that level of knowledge or confidence. Uh, so. And, and so that's why this particular topic of the temporary goals, which are relating to statements such as generosity is the karmic cause that will bring prosperity, morality is the karmic cause that will bring uh, a favorable form of 
rebirth, and patients will bring uh, then a good revenue. And um, it also, and, and the Romans had spent a little bit of time talking about patients in particular. And he said that there are two things, two qualities of patients that are identified. One is that, that, that we are more likely to have more uh, of a you know, circle of friends, if you like, if we're patient. That that would be one consequence uh, in this life of having been patient in a past life. Because what does that mean? It means that we are um, more tolerant, we are less likely to be quick to anger, and if we are a person who is angry with the antithesis of patience, that's a very much of an off-putting uh, quality or trait, and so we're likely to have less friends if we are a, you know, a cantankerous person, I can't think of a better word, an, an angry person, whatever. Um, so that was one aspect of it. And the other one is that um, patience is identified as a karmic cause for physical beauty, for physical attractiveness, and maybe also, um, you know, there, the, there's two kinds of beauty, there's physical beauty and then the inner beauty. Of, so, I don't know. Anyway, physical is one that's usually identified. So, and, and the notion is, uh, um, this is something we said recently in Buddhism that's very controversial, but the idea is that physical beauty is also something that uh, people are drawn to. And so in that sense, patients will uh, also, um, you know, contribute to your, your having, getting along with people easily and well. So in, in keeping with that, uh, Rupert just said that uh, an angry person can have a wide following, but typically it would be something that he, he or she is able to um, command by some sort of authority or by some sort of influence, not naturally, right? So that's one distinction about how patience is, uh, promotes that kind of um, you know, uh, ability to draw a circle of friends. Uh, he mentioned also that the other th remaining three paramitas also are said to have some uh, karmic uh, sort of um, consequence or, or result that's associated with them. So I mentioned in the case of effort, Natsundru, uh, Virya, that it produces uh, a quality which is, you know, which is a kind of um, uh, uh, almost, almost like a, a luster, a kind of um, majesty, um, a, a kind of uh, what's the word? Uh, dig dignity, or not dignity is not the right word. Uh, something almost physical, uh, some kind of brilliance, almost that uh, emanates from you as a result of a kind of majesty, a kind of majesty. Uh, that uh, you exude as a result of having been someone who cultivated um, effort. In the case of uh, one point of concentration, uh, it has the ability to, uh, to to quiet the mental afflictions, quiet them in the sense of uh, make them less active. It doesn't destroy them, but it, so it uh, reduces their overtness. And then in the case of wisdom, the main axiom of wisdom is that it, it can uh, promote liberation. So he mentioned those, uh, those points as well. Uh, but, uh, so the main consideration, or the main sort of physical, uh, philosophical kind of uh, issue about this temporary goal is uh, that it is uh, designated as being something that represents a, a epistemologically an extremely hidden object, something that we cannot verify for our, ourselves, but that we can believe in on the basis of that type of inference that's based on uh, having investigated the Buddha's teaching as a whole. Uh, I think I covered most of the points. Mm -hmm. 
then this, the, the, this predicate is they are uh, non-deceptive or unerring or correct uh, as relates to their import, the meaning that they express. The meaning that they indicate. They are unerring in what they say about their subject matter. And uh, so saying they're true uh, because they are a form of scriptural statement uh, which is free of any error as determined by the three kinds of analysis. So that's the formal argument. Uh, to to understand. Uh, then the point that's being made is that we can that's that's meant to be taken as a proof of the existence of the temporary goal. And the nature of the temporary goal, meaning that what are the qualities, what are the causes, what are the spiritual qualities that we need to um, carry out or cultivate in order to achieve that temporary goal, uh, then uh, we don't have the capacity to verify using our own ordinary reasoning powers to verify that, that, that such a relationship between those causes and those results is in fact true. Uh, in the same, not in the same way that we can um, recognize, or we can, we can um, investigate, or we can reflect on what the Buddha taught about the Four Noble Truths and how they are a valid doctrine to prove the existence of liberation, for example. Uh, so, um, in that sense, they are an extremely hidden object. The only way that we can verify that uh, assertion about the possibility of attaining that goal is by relying on uh, that form of analysis, threefold analysis of the Buddha's teaching as a whole. So that implies that we, we have to have know how to engage in that threefold analysis and engage in that threefold analysis. And if we do so, then that should be a uh, justification or, or a way of verifying that we can trust what the Buddha said about that extremely uh, hidden object. I'm trying to think now. Um, uh, so, just so what you mentioned again, those three elements of uh, the higher realm state as a temporary goal again. The three clauses for the element of prosperity and the element the rebirth being uh, due to practicing morality and uh, then having a, a good uh, relationship with some circle of uh, associates. That uh, those are things that we uh, we can rely on only because the Buddha uh, taught that that's there is that karmic relationship, cause and effect relationship between uh, those causes and those results. That's not something that we can uh, determine through our own ordinary reason. Um, I don't know if I, what else I may have left out. I don't think that, that I put it. Yeah, that is it. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all the hell. So, uh, as one element of um, of the formal logic, especially in, uh, in Indian tradition, is that a typically not necessarily following sort of the established rules of uh, the uh, logic schools, even outside of Buddhism, is one of the elements of a, of a complete uh, logical statement is. That it concludes that it includes a concordant example that is illustrative and is uh, supportive of the argument. 
to make the argument, the argument has a relationship with the predicate of a thesis, and then you give it an, an example uh, of which the predicate and, uh, um, and, the, and the reason are also true. So um, the illustrative example, or the concordant example that's given for this uh, particular proof of contemporary Gaul Buddhism is, for example, the uh, the Takarza Neleki Neleki Riparve. Just as, so the concordant example is just as one can establish the ultimate goal of the highest good, liberation, on the basis of. Uh, a traditional inference. I don't know what are the word. I can't remember the word for that. Modokirikpa, right? Modokirikpa means uh, an in regular inference, so we say. So regular inference can prove uh, the inference based on the explanations the Buddha gave how to prove the nature of the uh, highest good, and then that is put forth as the principal goal of the Buddha's teachings. Principal goal of the Buddha's teachings, the principal aim of the Buddha's teaching is to achieve the ultimate goals. And this goal is a more ordinary uh, goal. Pava is more uh, a lesser goal. So the validity of the, of the Buddha's teachings that enable us to infer these existence of the highest good serves as a concordant example that supports this other type of argument that's based on inference that relies on valid scripture uh, about its thesis. So the concordant example is that the principal goal is a more important goal, and so it carries some weight towards supporting the argument uh, in favor of the lesser goal. That is going to be Tandemi Arandu Nandu Kovanti Ami Lutenti Ani Sutum Sumane Sumati Nandu Shekhrava This Luna Tandemi Jaymi Shuchiki Tana Tandemi Kriyamere I need to do this as somebody did to me to do my own smarts. Dog, you are. You don't enjoy it. To do this. Soon, say you got it. Then a soldier from Vienna, soldier from the two hundred twenty two hundred soldier from Savi, soldier, two Savi, Kansati got it. Soldier from Savi at the tail of Pamela, two got you Pamela. Chutimamutogudriva. Chichesy, あさてですね、さんげです。さんげですね、ちょっと全然違うね。あの、あ、あ、ちょっと、ちょっとそれだけ、もうちょっと待ってください。ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと
then uh, if we were to verify it on our own, we would have to have, have to have some means of determining what was the specific act, at what time, in what place, as what sort of being, ourselves as the agent, and in relation to what other sentient being did we carry out the act. And so then there's another kind of interesting term. The, the word for morality in Tibetan is sul chim. Sul chim literally means sort of appropriate rules, almost, or uh, it means rules of behavior, right? The Sanskrit for it is shila. The Sanskrit word for shila doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean morality. Shila uh, is a neutral word, and that can refer to any conduct, can be shila. Uh, and then it has the specialized meaning of morality. Then there is another uh, prefix that you can put on shila, dukshila. Dukshila means uh, wrongful behavior. And the Tibetan equivalent of that is sutrin chelwa, or just sul chel. And so chel is wrongful. So wrongful behavior in Tibetan is tul chel. So tul chel would be the act the potential act of killing another sentient being, which we didn't do, and which we avoided as a form of morality, which is virtuous conduct, right? So, just terminologically, that uh, also is relevant. And But the point is, there's no way to determine that. We have no way of determining the specific instance of morality that determined that we were reborn in this life as humans. No way. And so it's in that sense that it's an extremely hidden object. And the only way that we can um, understand that that's the case is by relying on the Buddha's doctrine about karma and specifically the individual principles that he set forth. For example, the 10 non-virtuous karmic paths, the corresponding ten virtuous karmic paths, and how they uh, are, were explained and described as, as leading to these kinds of karmic results. So, if we rely on that, we can infer in a, in a general way, not in a, not in a precise way, that we, that we currently enjoy human life because we must have engaged in something like this in the past, why? The only way that we can answer that question is because we can rely on that, uh, the fact that the, the Buddha's doctrine is uh, supported uh, as being a system that withstands three kinds of analysis. And when we engage in that analysis, then we can, we can generate a sense of confidence strong confidence, not, not knowledge in the normal sense of knowledge, but knowledge in the sense of prudency demands that we accept uh, those pronouncements which the Buddha gave. And that's what the form of faith that's called belief is. It's belief at that level. It's not just blind belief, but it's justified belief uh, about the doctrine of karma uh, based on the fact that we have determined ourselves that the Buddha's sayings are trustworthy. So all of this is uh, relevant uh, epistemologically to the subject of this temporary goal and how we can uh, infer or, or believe that uh, certain kinds of behavior, certain kinds of moral conduct and related virtues will ensure that we can achieve that goal. Uh, that's 
다 상적이 떼갔어요. 탄저비 중국에서 탈반 저반인지 중국에서 떠오르는 지하라가 아니 중국에서 아, 추위 중국에서 추위 조남 지하라가 조남 추위 지하라가 조남 야쇼들에 중국에서 이날시 탄저비 중국에서 기부해 탄저비 기부한지 중국에서 기부한지 중국에서 기부한지 Sanjeev Tiamba Sikhya. Then I need Nungi Tiamba to stop it and the Sikhya. Tandegi Kibuke Jumo Jumo Sikhya. Jumo Sikhya. Nungo Tiamba. Nungo Karu Sumita. Nungi Tiamba to stop it and the Sikhya. Nungi Tiamba. Nungo Karu Sumita. Nungi Tiamba Kiyomi. 말이 말이 상기기 때문에 되시네요. 아 상기 때문에. 아 상기기 때문에 되나? 그럼 눈빛 때문에 또 그때 말씀이 일어나. 또 상기기 때문에 전가를 잡으려서는 탄력이 기분 중무 시켜서 찍으라. 상기기 때문에 하시게. 주석이. 또 양매치. 양수나야 또 찍으라. So, uh, so that wraps up the discussion of proving the temporary goal of, of attaining higher status, uh, or discussion of the uh, elements of that subject. So the next topic uh, is uh, attaining a realization that the teaching, Buddha's teaching, is flawless uh, to attain a uh, realization and some knowledge, gain an awareness that the Buddha's teaching as a whole is flawless. So that uh, phenomenon or that uh, topic uh, requires that we start by defining what do we mean when we say Buddhist teaching. Demba. Demba means Buddhist teaching. Shasana. Uh, so uh, then the formal definition of the teaching is uh, any person who is a seeker of liberation then uh, that entity, which is the uh, uses a word which means something like em, em point of entry, jukmok. Jukmok is uh, like point of embarkation. Like this, if you're going to go on, and you're going to um, go on a travel on a boat. So the place at which you to get onto the boat is like the Jumo. So if you're seeking liberation, there's some something that you must uh, then apply yourself to and, uh, as certainly the starting point and then uh, rely on if you want to reach that uh, desired goal. You're a seeker of liberation, so that's your aim. So such a person, for such a person, that subject, that that uh, object, rather, that you apply yourself to uh, as a mental object, right? Mikpa means a mental object, and which has two forms to it, either a scriptural aspect or a cognitional aspect. A scriptural aspect means the words uh, that by which the teaching is communicated. Cognitional aspect is the knowledge that you can generate by uh, embodying or integrating or uh, practicing that scriptural teaching and attaining an awareness of its meaning in your mind. So both of those are aspects of the teaching. So there's a scriptural form of the teaching and there's a form of the teaching that represents the attainment of various levels of the path. Oh, that is scientific. Then what I said, didn't it? 
they have, you know, had a sort of natural tendency to feel uh, concern and love uh, and caring for their own offspring. So that kind of, and, and, and those attitudes, we would say, represent some form, some quality of loving kindness and compassion. But we would not want to say that those represent cognitional forms of the teaching. And so even though they, they have, are qualitatively related to spiritual qualities that are gained through spiritual practice, we don't include them within that strict definition. So what is the kind of um, minimal condition for something to be a form of cognitional teaching? So then the determining quality is that we uh, are engaging in the act of refuge. So uh, in, if, we, if we carry out the act of taking refuge in the three dhatnas, then we have entered, quote, entered the teaching, and then whatever spiritual qualities that we gain on the basis of the scriptural teaching. So if we go beyond whatever natural uh, qualities or potential we have for developing spiritual qualities, and we take some uh, teaching of, that ultimately comes from the Buddha about how to cultivate loving kindness and compassion. And then we try to develop it. We try to, we understand it, and then we try to engender it in our own minds. And if we do engender it in our own minds, then it becomes a form of the cognition of teaching. And so we, we can develop all kinds of qualities, such as bodhicitta in that way. We can develop an awareness of emptiness in that way. And that awareness, of, obviously, is a form of knowledge or understanding. So that's a form of the cognition of teaching. Uh, then, beyond that, we mentioned there was uh, the qualities of abandonment. So the qualities of abandonment are more, um, what should I say, more restricted, more specific to having attained the transcendent path. Right? Yeah. They refer to the truth of cessation. Right? So we don't attain the truth of cessation until we achieve the path of seeing. Uh, but there are all, all, all kinds of spiritual qualities that we can develop through practicing uh, that rise to the level of the cognitional teaching before we achieve the path of seeing. Certainly when we achieve the path of seeing, then those are also the cognitional teaching. So when we reach that level of, say, the path of seeing, then we have generated the truth of the path. Then we have also generated some form of we, we, we've acquired some form of the truth of cessation. And those are the two defining attributes of the Dharma Rat. So once we attain those forms of the cognitional teaching, then we have attained the true refuge that the Dharma Ratna provides. Then it does the Cari ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ちゃんと、ち
ಅನಿಚ್ಛೆಯ ಕೆಲಸಕ್ಕೆ ದೇಶ ಜೀವಿ ಅನಿಚ್ಛೆಯ ಕೆಲಸ ಬಿಡ್ತಾನೆ ಬರೀ ಓ ಜೀವಿಸ ಅನಿಚ್ಛೆಯ So we're kind of equating the word teaching with the word dharma. Uh, and so when we say dharma, we talk about dharma in, with capital D meaning uh, the teaching, the spiritual dharma. Um, we, we, we should understand that to mean especially uh, the cognitional form of the Dharma. There is a scriptural form of the Dharma, that Dharma which uh, verbally gives expression to uh, spiritual practice. Uh, but the uh, important thing is uh, to understand how we should um, uh, how we should use the scriptural Dharma as the basis for ourselves to um, gain some uh, some uh, internal spiritual qualities that represent the true sense of the Dharma uh, in, in terms of say the Dharma uh, that we take refuge in as something that has the ability to give us protection or to uh, uh, to, to liberate us or save us from some uh, unwanted uh, and un, un, untoward consequence in the future. Typically we, as, uh, another point that Ramacha made which uh, I'm going back to from something you said earlier Typically, we think of temples, we think of scripture books, we think of images, we think of these things as, as things of, that are of spiritual value. But those things are inanimate objects that in and of themselves cannot do anything directly to um, save us. Sitting in a temple in and of itself uh, does not guarantee that we're going to uh, uh, escape uh, being reborn in the lower realms. Uh, then, so uh, then the dark, uh, the three, the, the act of refuge is carried out in relation to the the three ratnas. But among the three, uh, the, then the most important one for us directly is the Dharma Ratna in the sense that that is the, the, the actual refuge, that is the actual uh, entity that provides refuge. Uh, so the Buddhas cannot 
uh, willy-nilly save us by just wishing for us to be saved. They teach us the means by which we can save ourselves, and only when we take that teaching and, uh, and internalize it and practice it will we gain the ability to achieve true refuge. <coughs> so, also the act of refuge, when we take refuge in the three ratnas, it's that act itself is identified as uh, an, an act of placing your trust and placing your hopes in the spiritual, the three uh, objects that we recognize as necessary for us to achieve our spiritual goals. So we have to rely on them. We cannot do it on our own. But simply to recite the words of taking refuge and then sit back and do nothing is not likely to bring us very much. Uh, that taking refuge is not simply the act of reciting the formulas of taking refuge and in fact correctly placing your trust in them. It also implies that you will follow through on that act and uh, adopt uh, and uh, accept the instruction, learn the instruction and put it into practice. So, uh, the, the act of carrying out some kind of spiritual activity under the influence of the act of taking refuge in the three dharmas, that is the true meaning of, uh, the, uh, of the cognitional dharma. And moreover, those, those efforts uh, those activities, those forms of spiritual training that we engage in to cultivate spiritual qualities like compassion and loving kindness and bodhicitta and wisdom and so on, we can think that those, those in effect, those are also instances of taking refuge, going for refuge. So we're going for refuge in the sense that we are um, bringing about the, the actualization of what will uh, endow us with uh, the knowledge that will in fact protect us and uh, keep us safe from, for example, uh, having to be reborn in, uh, in the lower realms. So in that sense, engaging in the act of taking refuge and uh, uh, abiding by the principles of karma, avoiding non-virtuous deeds, and uh, cultivating virtuous ones as a form of morality, basic morality, uh, that can be actually a form of the dharma rat, of the dharma jewel. Uh, and for a person, the practitioners of lesser capacity, that is the dharma rat. That is what protects, that is what gives refuge to that type of practitioner in that it guarantees that he or she will uh, not fall into the lower realms. So when we think of the, uh, the Dharma Ratna in the stricter sense of either the truth of cessation or the truth of the path, any one of those two elements, that's a form of the Dharma Ratna that is, at this point, truly the more ideal form of the Dharma Ratna, but it, for, for us it's probably a little bit, for the present, beyond our grasp. But the more basic form of taking refuge and practicing the morality of avoiding the ten non-virtuous deeds, that is a real form of dharma in the sense that it is can directly and immediately give us some refuge. And we should think of that. And so that is the form of the dharma in the sense of <coughs> as a cognitional dharma or cognitional teaching 
that uh, we need to uh, resort to, resort to as an act of refuge, as the act that will provide refuge. And so it is the true form of taking another form, another way to think of the act of taking refuge besides simply mentally entrusting yourself to the three drops. It is kind of the necessary consequence of that. If you, if you truly entrust yourself in the three dhatnas, then it, that should imply that you are ready and willing to engage in those activities that will ensure that we benefit from the potential of the Dharma to give us some genuine refuge. So we're almost out of time. This is what we've been talking about most recently. We should understand under the uh, the uh, subject of what is the Buddha's teaching. How do we understand the Buddha's teaching? It's scriptural form and it's cognitional form. And the general goal is to be able to recognize that it is flawless, to, to determine for ourselves that the, the teaching is flawless, both in its scriptural form and in its cognitional form. So having uh, given this introduction to that topic, with a few remaining minutes, uh, and questions, invite questions. Which seems to me as, as kind of a very like wait a minute, you lost me a cessation. Uh, well, you, did you say that when you when you complete a karmic act, that that's considered a cessation? Oh right, all oh, right, okay, yes, okay, we're going back to that. Yes, right. okay. And then so that's a that's a way of describing something in terms of a kind of absence almost to me. At least the terminology is a kind of an absence. But then, even when Rinpoche himself was describing then things like projecting karma, producing karma, those are still very positive um, right. elements and entities. So I'm just wondering if there's a way to reconcile those two 
like the, the fact that there's one that's a cessation that seems like an absence or a negative, and then and the fact that you still have this positive quality of, okay, that's it. Um, I probably drew up. Can you go in there? 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 Can you Give a little bit of some jolly, give it, give a little bit of some jolly. In a so so we look in the Tademare in a uh, as a Tilliace Assolti. Santilly, what's that? Tadeamante, 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 Tadeamante,
Alle kan ikke det her sige, at nævne det her. Læg en godt til det stikker. Der lader det, når kasser og læg en kasser i bøger. Kasser og læg en kasser i bøger. Læg en kasser i bøger. Han er lykkelig inden. Lykkelig inden bare rejekter. Læg de kasser i onsdag og kapten. Lykkelig inden bare rejekter. Nella Fiore. Quindi, che si inibba della nella ricerca di un bel caso 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 di un bel Nah, kalau sih pas saya dia, tu sih pas saya dia, kalau mewah sorci rek, ane mewah dia lah, ane kalau kencing ke nuba, tang sorci ke nuba, lesen dia lah, ane tu sih pas lah kerja sini nuba tu kiat tu kerja sini. Yang sini, sih pas sih itu mewah sih itu sih ni ni ti, mami show dia lepa, mami show dia nun seni sih berba. Mamisho dia semua. Mamisho mana mami bawa je tu macam apa? Mami bawa. Mami si tu mana mami bawa je tu macam apa? Tapi mami si tu yang apa? Si ada yang apa ni? Si pun si ada yang apa? Macam mana pun pun si pun mana pun tu dah dah lagi macam apa? Okay. So the which is answer was to kind of describe those two elements of our being, physically in particular. Uh, these are distinctions that are appear in the Abhidharma and, uh, you know, the discussions that there, there are, there's a relevancy to making a distinction between the aspect of our body that is, uh, represents our coarse physical form and it's associated with, as you indicated, the uh, source of it is from your parents. And then that develops into your force physical body. And the, the body, the element of your physical being that is a karmic maturation is distinct from that, but not separate from that. So uh, that was kind of the point that was being made. So, uh, so the, 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 there's, I don't know, I can't remember the exact Gemali Gurwa. I'm not sure literally how to translate that. I mean, I think sort of it's developmental. I'm not sure what else to say. Is the rough physical body. Uh, and the other form of the body is the, body, the aspect of our physical being that is a karmic ripening. So the element that represents those separate aspects of our physical being are, can be understood such that the de developmental aspect of our body corresponds to our rough physical body. That's something that is uh, discarded when, when we die, for instance, a, a, a physical corpse, and it's something that can be incinerated when you, you know, if you, uh, what do we call it? Um, Creamish. <laughs> Uh, it could be cremated. But the maturation body is not, it's different. So that's associated with a more subtle aspect of our being, and in particular, it's identified with our faculties. Uh, and our faculties, you know, they have a, the specific faculties associated with a particular birth, they have some finite quality in that they are uh, relate to that particular form of existence uh, and they have the form so the, the fact the sense faculties are physical of a human being only uh, persists for as long as you are a human being but that quality of being part of your physical being will continue that faculty element of your being uh, so
so um, it can also uh, you know have some sort of um, finite quality that it can come to an end it can uh, reach the point where it uh, no longer functions now that was the first part. Second part was service and shoe make us under. As a long jew man, you can say shoe a yarba. Oh, it is. The chet on his shoe a yarba. That's a shoe a message. Oh, no, 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 he meant the, the, about this thing that we said, we use the word cessation, and uh, I think uh, uh, what's it, Paul kind of said, that's really, a, a, people associate cessation with like the truth of cessation, so that's probably not the uh, ideal word. So we were talking about it, and I think disintegration. disintegration of something, or the destruction of something that existed, and then Underwent uh, disintegration or destruction, right? But th that quality of having undergone disintegration or gone to a state of disintegration or destruction is does, is not a a form of non-existence, right? The argument, if so, which is sort of just to throw this back at you to consider it. If the disintegration or destruction were non-existent then uh, the lamp would never go out. Right? So the disintegration of the lamp is a condition that comes about because the fuel has been exhausted. And so therefore we say the lamp has been extinguished or you know, uh, gone out, right? Gone to a state of not, not, not I don't say non-existent, but saying uh, that word for it's that's insurance, right? But <laughs> if that if that didn't if that were not an entity that existed, not a condition that came into being, then the thing would not cease. That was one thing. So another thing that he said was, if there were not such a such a dis, uh, you know. I said, Gisha. Okay, leave it alone. Time is gone. Oh uh, yeah.